Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you everyone for being here today. And today I want to share with you some of our work and some of my reasons why I was doing that. So when I was about 10 years old or so, I had two hobbies. One hobby was to chase insects and butterflies and different animals around the house. And the second one was to disassemble these type of watches and batteries, trying to make things that work together. Now, today, actually this month, I'm for 10 years at Imperial College London as a professor and basically still do the same thing. <laughs> so it's, uh, I hope, some progression, but still the same idea of trying to understand the natural world and trying to build things that behave a bit or look like um, uh, artificial living systems. So in this talk, I would want to ask three questions. Number one is, how can such robots help us to achieve the United Nations Sustainability Goals? The second one, how do we um, build such robots? And third, how they can interact with our lives. So how do, we, do they become part of our society, of our ecosystem, of our cities and infrastructure systems? So if you talk about the sustainable development um, and the United Nations sustainability goals, they are very wide ranging, but these ones here are some that are very important and where robotics can help a lot. One of them is in climate monitoring, so the collecting data, which can then be used to validate climate models combined with satellite data and like this protect the environment, but also water health monitoring, infrastructure asset monitoring, and also repairing and manufacturing of those assets. So the question is really, what is missing? What is the technology that will really help to address that from a robotics and AI space? And my take on that, or in my group, what we work on is to develop a Swiss army knife based approach of robotic capability that really goes across different um, uh, capabilities of robotics that can really enable this type of data collection, interaction, repair, manufacturing. And some of that includes sensor placement, online data analysis using AI based methods, also autonomous flights through those environments, bio hybrid robots that biodegrade in the, in the environment when they um, kind of uh, die in the environment if that happens, and also doing 3D printing and repair tasks. So my hypothesis is basically that um, flying lifelike robots are the ones that can do that because they can operate in outdoor environments. They're very different from the lab-based robots that we see around the world, but really getting closer to nature is where we all want to go. And so the question of how to build them really is a very important part. And I think it was mentioned this morning already that multidisciplinary you know, science and development is very important. Now often, however, um, in robotics at least, what happens is that the robot gets developed in simulation, gets simulated, then there's a controller design that gets developed, then gets tested in simulation, then the components are selected, everything is integrated, and then it kind of works in a laboratory environment, and often not very well in outdoor unpredictable conditions. Now, because of this linear approach to robot development that starts in simulation, I think we don't see the capability that we want to see yet. Nature, however, works very different. Nature co-evolves the materials, the actuators, the sensors, the structures, the chemistry, the neural pathways, and the hormone system all together. So it's not like nature takes a dead body and puts a controller on it and tries to make it operate. It co-evolves it along the way. And this uh, circular co-evolution of disciplines and of capabilities is what I refer here to as physical artificial intelligence. So it's a method of synthesis, of developing robots by asking the scientific questions at the scientific uh, disciplines, at the borders of scientific disciplines. And so in my group, what we work on is a variety of use cases from robots that can fly in fire, robots that can attach themselves to wind turbine blades to do repair and assessment tasks, robots that can take water samples, place sensors on bridges. But I would like today to focus on only two aspects of that, two use cases um, for illustration. And one of them is robots that would operate in the natural environment and close the life cycle. So robots that can operate, collect data, die in the environment, regrow and reoperate again. So like artificial living systems. And the second one on robots that can 3D print from flight, like this doing repair and manufacturing tasks. So in terms of those transient systems, as we call them, um, the use case is environmental sensing at large, and often we really need the data to collect 
um, and then help in the climate models, study the microclimates in the trees and study biodiversity. And if you look at the forests, it's extremely complex. It's unpredictable, everything moves. Light irrigation is changing all the time. GPS doesn't work very well. And so we can learn a lot from nature of how natural systems operate in those environments. One of the principles of how they operate is by using optical flow divergence. This OFD is the relationship of the velocity approaching a surface to the distance. And it's an intrinsic method that can be used by just looking at the motion of the environment on the retina to estimate as a proxy the distance to something and like this ob ob um, avoid ob objects or land on objects. Now we have um, build robots that use those same principles and like this can fly through forests, avoid objects or stand, but also fly through gaps in the forest. And this by using this kind of reflex-based controller, behavior-based controllers that you see here. So you can fly through the forest, through gaps, and this with only about 20 grams of electronics. So it's a bio-inspired minimalist control strategy that can really enable very small vehicles to do relatively complex behaviors. We can then extend this and integrate it with uh, machine learning based uh, methods to do tactile flights, so fly in contact, sense the environment, place sensors or sample the surfaces, and like this uh, have a capability on a very small robot that is very powerful and can lead to a lot of different applications in mining, offshore energy, a pipeline inspection repair and industrial facilities at large. So again, there's a lot to learn from nature and we're still just one step in this journey. Another example just to share is here a drone that can fly. It detects a tree and it can place a sensor on the tree by shooting the sensor as you've seen here. So it's a dart. So it can detect the surface and then shoot the, deck, the dart system, which can then act as a sensor being like this placed extremely quickly onto the tree without having to, you know, climb up and put the sensor there. So this is extremely powerful in terms of com by comparing it to manual methods that are happening today. And by then looking at the acoustics of those sensors, we can do a machine learning based analysis and quantify the biodiversity in the tree. So which birds are there, how much many birds are there and how can we then start, how can we see where the birds migrate as the climate is changing? The next stage after that is to look at ways how those, those sensors and micro robots get dispersed through the environment. And that's a paper we published a few, a uh, few weeks ago, now earlier this year, which again um, outlines the near future, which is simple sensing on temperature, humidity, but also how um, rain quality or even acoustic sensors could be made entirely biodegradable so that you can disperse them and then they fall apart. The data is uh, streamed back onto the drone using RFID uh, tags, for example, and the sensors give zero e-waste. And I think this is something that we'll see much more, that robots become integrated into the life cycle and can, like this can biodegrade in the environment. Now, we work on that for quite a while and we work on the structures, the sensors and the actuators and these are the core uh, modules of robotic systems. And here is just a picture of how this looks like and what kind of materials we use. And we use predominantly cellulose based materials. So we can use the cellulose, we can manufacture it so that it becomes a cryogel. So it's a freeze drying of the cellulose. And we can then functionalize it using conductive inks that create sensor systems. With that, we can also create um, capacitors or eventually even batteries and actuators as well by you looking at humidity triggered actuation of structures that swell in certain situations. And like this can help with certain robot functionality of gripping, attachment, motion through the environment and so on. And all of this is done at the material level. It's not a controller that does it. It's the material that is intelligent. And this is again where we can come back to nature and how nature builds. It's by using also functionalization of the, uh, of the material. And like this, it is a form of distributed edge computing into the periphery of the body of the robot. And I think that will make quite a difference in future. Okay, so the next um, example I would like to share with you today is on robots that cannot just collect data in the environment, but then use this data to manufacture or repair the environment. And this is something that we call aerial additive manufacturing. 
And it is the idea to use robot swarms that collectively 3D print structures from flight, like this, removing the need for scaffolding, removing the need to bring on-site large 3D printers that can then build up some structures. Of course, as you can imagine from this picture, it's quite a challenge, right? You need to stabilize the robot. It's about the materials. It's about the assessment, on-site control, like uh, in-situ control of the process and so on. And so we're working on that since 2014. And we have analyzed in earlier publications also how nature builds. And again, nature doesn't like build like humans would with the blueprint and the star architect, you know, comes in and makes the blueprint. So there's no star architect B here, right? So they, they use a very different method of, um, of building. And one of the methods is distributed local decision making between the agents. In fact, one important thing that they do is that they build. And as they build, they use the built environment to relay information. So the next bee is building on top of what the previous bee has been building. So it's using the environment as a form of communication. And this um, iterative, distributed, um, collective um, manufacturing is something that is extremely powerful and scalable as well. <clears throat> so here's the um, video that shows this concept of aerial additive manufacturing. And basically how it works is that we have uh, the current technology also in construction being prefabrication, but also pre 3D printing on site. And this is typically limited by the size of the printer. So if you want to build a building, the 3D printer needs to be bigger than the building, right? And often that's not very convenient because you have access issues, takes a lot of time, logistic costs and so on to bring this on site. So our concept here is to have a swarm of distributed small flying 3D printing heads that can allow us to build those structures in a distributed parallel manner very like potentially much faster, safer, and at a lower cost in terms of time and finances and logistics compared to 3D printing and static printers. So we have done this um, over the last years. And one of the embodiments of that you see here, so that's basically an autonomous flying robot that uses a cement, cementitious material on board that it can then extrude and it stabilizes the tip using a delta R manipulator. Because of that, um, we can create those layers of materials that are then stacked together. We optimize all of this and also the material itself, because the material needs to be easy to extrude, but still strong enough to stay in place so that you can build layers relatively quickly. Now, this demonstration is a proof of concept, so you're not going to live inside of this uh, cylinder, right? I mean, you might maybe, but it's, it's basically showing that we can do 27 layers. So successfully, it's scalable, we can keep on doing that. And basically, the framework we present here uh, can be applicable on various robots that work together. The next stage after that is um, using foam materials. So this is a different um, robot example or validation by using relatively low precision foam material which is hard to deposit extremely precisely because it expands, it kind of sprays around. And for that, we have a scanning drone, which then flies, scans the structure that has been built, and then adjusts the next trajectory of the 3D printing robot. So it's a closed loop adjustment of the 3D printing process, allowing the robot swarm then to build up layers, in this case, 72 layers, by doing this um, kind of in situ online closed loop 3D printing control. So again, it's not about this cylinder. It's about the idea that we can use swarms of distributed systems together with humans, together with ground robots or mobile robots or on the construction side to give value and create structures that are scalable, that the risks are lower, the costs are lower, and the capacity to manufacture a lot quickly um, is provided. So this paper um, just came out, as Rakesh mentioned, uh, last week. And I'm very happy about this because it uh, summarizes about six years of work. So it's quite exciting to have it all come together. And again, it was about the multidisciplinary coevolution of materials, structures, control, robot body, and so on to allow for that. So the next stage is to use that in outdoor environments. And so this is the headquarters of my group in Switzerland, where we are going now to test those robots and construct larger structures outdoors. So we are very excited about that and also looking for partners to advance this together. So if I end with a prediction for the next 10, 20, 30 years, I would say it is that robots will become benevolent 
co-inhabitants and collaborators of us. We will not be scared of them as much as we are now and will consider them and experience them as our friends and our indispensable tools. In the same way as today we experience the mobile phones, the robots will be the next generation of them moving and working alongside with us. Thank you very much.